All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hour. My name is John Mueller. I am a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do is talk with publishers and webmasters like the fantastic ones here in the Hangout now, and, and of course, the ones that submitted all these questions. Um, maybe before we start, is there anything on your mind? Is any questions that we need to answer before I run through the, the Q&A? Yeah, John, I've got a quick question. OK. Um, with the recent news about um, eBay adopting AMP, um, is that something that all webmasters now, regardless of what type of site they are, should be getting onto, the, the, getting onto AMP? Um, if you ask the AMP team, they will tell you that all websites should be using AMP. So to some extent, I, I can see that making sense. Um, it's, it's definitely one way to make really fast uh, websites or web pages that, that load almost instantly. So I think it's a, a technology that's not really going to go away anytime soon. So if you're, you've been holding off because you're saying, well, my website doesn't need this, then maybe it makes sense to kind of take a look again to see what it does now. So at the moment, we, we only show it for the, the kind of in the news carousel on top, uh, the top stories carousel, I think it's called. And uh, that's something where I expect it to kind of expand to, to other parts of the search results as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah, because I think with the eBay one, I think they had problems with, um, even though it was in AMP, they couldn't add to cart or something like that. They didn't have that functionality on the site. So yeah, it'd be there, interesting there's to see definitely how some things that don't work so well with AMP at the moment. But it's an open source project. So I think people from eBay are active there as well, making new components. And that's something that I expect to evolve over time. I, I'm really happy that someone like eBay is taking the time to, to do these kind of experiments, because even if they're not shown in search yet, um, we, we can't get there without people actively trying things that, that kind of go past uh, what's possible now. So I, I imagine if someone like eBay can get it to work for their site, which is really dynamic, which requires a lot of interaction, then that's something that would be possible for a lot of other sites as well. Interesting times ahead. Cheers, John. All right. Uh, let me run off through some of these questions. And if you all have any questions or comments in between, feel free to speak up. Uh, otherwise, I'll try to leave some room at the end so that we can chat about other issues that might be coming up. Um, we filled out a spam report for a site uh, that are doing domain crowding, doorway pages, unnatural links, and there wasn't enough room to put all the evidence in the report, so we sent you an email. Can you just um, yes. So I'm, I'm not sure, completely sure which report this refers to. But in general, the, the reports I get like this, I do pass on to the website team. But that doesn't mean that they'll be able to take action immediately on, on a lot of these things. So this is something where they, they have to kind of look at the report and figure out what, what's the right uh, approach here. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to do manual action. Sometimes uh, the, there are different shades of manual action that are possible. So it's not always going to be the case that all of the sites that you report are going to disappear from the search results completely, even if the, the web SAM team does take manual action. And other times, they will take these reports and say, well, this is a more of a general problem that we need to solve on a broader level. And they'll try to find more automated or algorithmic approach to this problem. And that does take a bit of time. But uh, the good news there is, of course, uh, that want to kind of tackle a problem more algorithmically, then it's not limited to just those sites that you submitted, but it's actually something that we can apply across the web as a whole. So just because you didn't get a response or ignored, uh, they're really valuable for the team here. Um, we did some work for a couple of firms, and they put a link in their useful suppliers page recommending us. Our SEO agency disavowed these a few months back, as their business is not related to ours. And, but is there any harm in putting it back, as it's natural? Um, if this is essentially a natural link where people are recommending your services, I would not worry about that. I don't 
thing because it doesn't have to be the complete useful link. Uh, sometimes that's that's helpful for other people that are looking at those sites as well. On the other hand, if that link is only there because of a business relationship that's taking place where you say, I'll give you, I don't know, 10% discount, and in exchange you put me on this link list here, then that's something that, that would fall into the category of unnatural links. So that's something where you probably know best uh, what the background is there. And if this is just a link where people are saying, well, they did a great job, I recommend them uh, for, for other people, then I, I would just leave that link there. I think that's a, a normal, natural link. Uh, can external linking give either an SEO uh, benefit to the page it's on if the link is going out was relevant or useful to that page or help to improve the quality of that page in what Google sees? Um, we seem to be getting this question a lot with regards to what if I put some really good external links on my page? Does that mean Google will think my page is more valuable? And this is something that people have been doing for a really long time, way in the beginning of, of Google. It's something where you would see really spammy sites uh, put, put a link in their footer saying, oh, here's Yahoo, there's Wikipedia, there's a link to Google, in the hope that search engines, when they look at this page, say, oh, well, it can't be that spammy. Look, there's a link to Wikipedia. This must be really high-quality content. And it doesn't work that way. So just because you put a link to a high-quality site on your pages doesn't mean that your pages are automatically high-quality. You really need to kind of look at the bigger picture uh, at, at the page complete overall and make sure that everything on that page is valuable and high quality. And of course, so put links to external sites on pages because they're good references for your users. But uh, just because there's a link to a high quality site doesn't make that page more valuable. Uh, we have an e-commerce site, and on our product pages, we wanted to add links to related products. Will this help add value to the page, and is this a good idea? Uh, if so, is there any particular way to do that? So at first glance, you might think this is similar to the previous question, but I think this is more about cross-linking within the same website. So uh, that's something that, from, from my point of view, is, is a really good thing to do. It, on the one hand, it makes it easier for users to find related products within your website. On the other hand, it makes it easier for search engines to crawl through your website. So it doesn't have to like crawl all the way top to the category page again and then crawl down to the individual products. There's kind of this connection between those products as well. And it does give a bit more context to us. So if we can recognize that these are related products, then that helps us to better understand what this individual page kind of means in the context of your whole website. So that's something I definitely recommend doing. Um, for blogs, for example, there, there are plugins that help do that to kind of create related links within your blog uh, across individual blog posts. That's, that's perfectly fine. I think that's, that's a good, uh, good approach and helps users, helps search engines. Uh, what more could you want? Uh, is there any chance of having an office hours hangout about structured data with members of the structured data team? Uh, I would love to ask them really tough questions directly as I never get clear reply in the forums. Um, yes. I'm, I mean, chance. It's, it's easy for me to say because I'm not uh, on the structured data team, um, but uh, I, I think that might make sense to, to really put something together specifically with them um, so that you can ask them these questions directly. Uh, for some of these things, or I, I guess for a lot of the things that, that get posted in the forum, for example, the top contributors there do take those issues and they bubble them up and we pass them on to the structured data team to try to get a, a more official answer. Uh, but sometimes it might make sense or make it a little bit easier if you could chat with them directly once. Um, so I'll definitely be talking with them to see if we can get this set up. Um, with uh, the, the holidays in the US coming up and general summer holidays, I don't think that'll happen like next couple of weeks, but uh, maybe we can get something set up uh, for, for a bit later this year. Um, at SMX Advanced last month, Gary told us, 
that you knew who had written that article without authorship. Um, does this mean you take that into account? Who wrote an article when evaluating the quality of the content? So it's, it's not so much that we know which person wrote which article, but uh, if we find the, the same article in multiple places on the web, then we're pretty good at figuring out where this kind of originated from. So with, with that in mind, we, we do try to bubble up the original content on a site. And that's something we, we would take into account uh, when, when looking at the kind of like how we should show a page in the search results, how, how these individual pages are relevant for this specific query. Is this like just a copy of an existing article, or is this uh, something that was originally written by, by this person or by that site? Um, so also, another thing he mentioned is that we don't use authorship markup at all. So if you have been kind of holding off on like whether or not to add authorship markup to your site, you really don't need to do that. At the same time, you don't need to remove it either. So it's not the case that you would have any problems by removing it. But uh, if you're doing a revamp of your site, if you're cleaning things out that you don't need anymore, which is always good to do, then Maybe that's that's something you could drop. Uh, we changed our URL structure last October and set lots of old pages to no index. However, I just realized that many of these pages had also been set up as 301s to new URLs. Uh, have we been have we screwed up? And if so, what should we do now? Um, it's hard to say if if you messed up there. Um, in general, if a page is 301 redirecting, then we wouldn't see that there's a robots meta tag associated with that page. So there's an, theoretically an option that it could be associated with, with an HTTP header. But for the most part, you would put a no index in the, as a meta tag within the HTML page. And if that URL is actually redirecting somewhere else, then we wouldn't see that no index anyway. So that's something where probably the, we're recognizing the redirects. Probably the, the redirects are, are the part that, that you're more interested in and uh, not seeing any no index there because we can't actually access that page directly. So if that's the case and if the redirects are what you really wanted, then you should be OK. There's nothing that, that kind of broke there in that case. Uh, past year, I had a schema on the search, and suddenly this week, earlier, it was lost. I had no errors in structured data compared to my competitors. Any guess what can help me to kind of get that back? So this is something that can happen from time to time. Uh, so I, I assume with uh, schema, you mean rich snippets, rich snippets markup that's shown in the search results. And from our point of view, we have three criteria that we use for rich snippets. On the one hand, it has to be technically implemented correctly. I assume if this was working earlier, then that's the case here. On the other hand, it has to be kind of policy conform. So you need to make sure that whatever markup you're using matches the policies we have for that markup. So if you're using recipe markup, don't put it on pages that aren't recipes. That, that's a kind of simple one. And uh, the last one is usually the hardest one, is that we require a certain kind of quality threshold of the site in general for us to display those rich snippets. So we kind of want to make sure that we can really trust this website and that we do be OK with showing those rich snippets. And sometimes we reevaluate sites, and our algorithms say, well, this wasn't really as fantastically high quality as we thought before. And that's something that might be reflected in whether or not the rich snippets are shown or not. So if, you, if you're sure that technically it's correct, it's correct from a policy point of view, then you might need to kind of take a step back and think about what you can do to significantly take your site to a higher level from a quality point of view. Uh, you made some changes to schema.org as we suddenly get errors in our structured data for our products. We fixed this a few weeks ago, but Search Console is very slow to update. How long will it take? Oh, man, Search Console, you need to put the turbo gear in. Um, so in general, this isn't actually Search Console's fault. It's more the case that uh, we 
need to recrawl pages from your site and re-index them. And that's something that doesn't happen from one day to the next. So when we crawl pages within a website, some pages, probably the most important ones, end up getting crawled very quickly within a couple of days. So you would see that data reflected fairly quickly in Search Console. Other pages take a couple of weeks or even months sometimes to, to be updated. So that's something where you'll probably see the important pages be updated faster in Search Console, especially in the structured data report. And the pages that take longer to recrawl, they'll kind of linger along in, this, in the structured data report until we've been able to recrawl them, reprocess them, and recognize that you've uh, kind of improved your markup there. Hey John, uh, one, one follow-up question yes. on this. Uh, in uh, in my website, throughout the website, I'm using hreflang. OK. So uh, when I'm seeing sitemap index pages, it is showing me higher URLs are indexed. But when I am seeing uh, international targeting and hreflang lang found, it is showing me two less numbers of those pages. So how it is possible that search engine has crawled those pages? hreflang is available, but it is showing two less number of hreflang, uh, while in indexing it is showing much higher number of pages indexed. I probably need to to take a look at the details there, but what my I think we're indexing these pages and not recognizing the hreflang markup there, or not able to verify that the hreflang markup is correct there. So that's something where, where maybe you, you would see a difference like that. Um, usually in the, the international targeting report, we show you examples of the errors that we found. So that kind of helps guide things along there. Um, another aspect that probably plays a role in, in the, the hreflang report there as well, which is something that we have across Search Console, is that a lot of these reports are based on kind of a significant sample of your website. They're not based on a comprehensive look at all of the URLs that we have indexed. It's more like these are, these are the main, the primary URLs of your website, and those are the ones that we'd focus on for a lot of kind of the, the how many of these did we find reports. So you would see that in structured data, where you have the graph of the pages with structured data. Probably also with hreflang, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, you'd also see that with AMP. That's something where um, probably at some point in the AMP report, we'll, we'll have to adjust that as well, because I think we were looking at a bigger group compared to the, the rest of your website. So we want to kind of match that. Um, I think that's also the case for I don't know. I'd have to think about the, the other reports that we have. But uh, essentially, that's probably where you're seeing part of that mismatch as well. So on the one hand, the markup has to be correct and confirmed. Whoa. Someone has a buzzer. Um, <laughs> the, the markup has to be correct. And on the other hand, we, we're probably showing uh, the graph based on a significant sample rather than the complete set of indexed URLs. Okay. However, in uh, Search Console, there is no error found in hreflang, so I don't think <laughs> yeah. that there would be any technical issue. But there was some number difference. Um, so, is it just that the number is lower, or is it that the number is zero? Uh, no, not zero. Like 400 pages are indexed in sitemap, but only 50 URLs are found in hreflang. While in other relevant website, uh, which I am pointing in with hreflang, there are more numbers are uh, pages found with hreflang. Okay. That website that website has hundred percent pages with hreflang. Yeah. So it might just be that we don't recognize the hreflang markup at all on those pages. So we we like for example, what what might happen is. Uh, we, we can crawl and index those pages, but when, when we render those pages, something in the head section of the pages um, is added early on, and that kind of breaks everything within the head, which includes uh, the hreflang markup. So that might theoretically be happening. And if we can't find the hreflang markup at all, we won't flag it as an error, because we think there, there's nothing wrong with a page that doesn't have hreflang. So 
that might be something worth double checking. So what you can do there is open the page in a browser and use inspect element to see what the rendered view of the page actually looks like. And then double check to make sure that within the head section there is actually nothing like non-meta tag type uh, that, that's actually listed there. OK, thanks. I will double check it. Sure. Thanks. All right. Um, any plans for Search Console adding a tool for doing keyword research and search traffic estimates? Many SEOs use the AdWords Keyword Planner tool, and they recently changed something, so everyone is upset. Um, I don't know of any such plans. So in the past, we've always referred to the AdWords Keyword Planner as something that people can use uh, for, for this information. So if that doesn't work anymore, maybe we need to figure something else out. Uh, this is probably also some useful feedback to give back to, to the AdWords team in the AdWords Help Forum. If, you're, if you've been relying on this tool and it suddenly does something completely different that you can't really use, then that might be useful feedback to give to them. Um, they uh, might, in turn, tell you that you're holding it wrong, which could be useful feedback as well, because this is not really kind of a search tool, but more of an, an AdWords tool. But uh, if you're finding that this is something that you're really missing and you really need this information to kind of improve your websites in search, then by all means, let us know so that we can think about what we need to do from the Search Console side there. Uh, John, I actually wanted to ask you something regarding this. I, I know of the update as well, and I also know that Google has been trying lately to uh, put more effort, at least in Europe, to, to with the growth engine and all these programs to help small businesses, uh, you know, uh, understand better what they need to do uh, with online marketing and how Google can help them. And uh, this has always been a problem and a missing part of the uh, side that uh, a small business cannot really doesn't really know where to start. You know, doesn't know what the audience is searching for and needs to rely on a you know a tool specifically made for paid campaigns to kind of guess what they should you know how their structure of the website should be, what they should be targeting on the organic side as well. So uh, uh, this. Uh, would be useful, you know, if we had something, you know, that would help us in the initial stage. You know, you're just launching the website, so you need to know like what you should target and what are the audience is looking for. Because if you build just a new website and you're looking at the search console, you won't be able to see at the beginning a lot of queries that could help you with that. So relying on on the AdWords tool is, uh, is something that unless uh, you know uh, a small business hires an SEO professional they might not know you know there is that how to deal with it okay good feedback so in in short we have to think what think about what we could do there um, it's always tight because the search console team also has lots of other things that are really important and interesting to do but uh, it's I I'd also give this uh, feedback to the AdWords team as well, just so that they're, they're kind of aware of that. I imagine they're seeing you guys tweet about this as well. But uh, it's good to spread spread the load. There are cases you know, where you can use like uh, things like the AdWords tools or something related to social media to kind of get some insights that will help you on the organic side. But in this case, it's something that you kind of are, you really need uh, the keyword research to help you understand what the audience is searching for at the beginning of your project, of your business project. Uh, it's not something that you can really skip in that sense. OK. All right. Can I, can I follow up on that? Sure. Um, well, two things. One, if you start a project without knowing what your customers are searching for, you probably should start another project um, because it seems like you're putting the, <laughs> the cart before the horse um, but but secondly is the is the AdWords the keyword planner is that data solely sourced from AdWords no organic stuff at all 
I thought it was based on search data. So because I, I was told before that, that that's search from only from AdWords databases, so don't assume that that is. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> about all of these ad tools, I like I, I I've been keeping my hands off them for a while. So, um, yeah, I I don't know the details there. I mean, it must have a combo because it, it gives a an estimated bid price and competition. So there's no there's no such thing as competition purely for organic words, although there is. But there, there's no you can't measure it as such. So I I always understood that was a hundred percent AdWords data. So don't yeah. uh, previous advice I've been given is don't use it as purely organic research because it is only people that are bidding on stuff. So if, if it's a non competitive industry, you're not gonna get the information you need. I have no idea. I I need to look at <laughs> that'd be something that would be something good to share with people. Yeah. I mean Maybe maybe this is something where we could give some tips on, in general as well. But uh, I so so far I've been able to kind of keep my hands off of that by just sitting there because uh, they they're doing a pretty good job at that. And if we have to figure out like or change our recommendations in that regard, then that means we have to kind of rethink some some things. So I I don't have any great answer for that at the moment. All right, um, we have some branch pages, but these are not linked directly to our category pages. Is that a problem if we want to rank those categories to rank for those branches, or can Google work it out? Um, not completely sure what you mean with branch, but in general, if these are pages within your website that aren't well linked with the rest of your website, then it makes it really hard for us to kind of figure out what the context is of these pages and to finalize, for example, that they exist or that uh, they've recently changed or that we need to go off and, and crawl them again and index them again. So the, the easier we can reach all of your pages within your website by starting anywhere within your website, the more likely we'll be able to kind of crawl through everything without having any problems, and the easier it'll be for us to see those pages as well, because we understand the context of those pages a little bit better. Uh, can I have the same meta descriptions of different web pages? Sure, you can, you can do that. Uh, from our point of view, what will possibly happen is that uh, our algorithms will recognize that this is the same meta description on a bunch of different pages, and maybe they'll say, well, maybe this is not such a great meta description. And for the snippet, then use something more from the con from the text itself uh, within the web page. But uh, if you want to use the same meta description for a bunch of different pages, especially if these are similar pages, then maybe that makes sense. That's, that's something you can definitely do. Uh, there's certainly no penalty for doing that. It's just a matter of which snippet is actually shown in the search results. Uh, if a WordPress multi-site has 50 subdomains and there's duplicate content across these subdomains, would external sites outside of the multi-site that link to this content be penalized or have their search rankings impacted by linking to this duplicate content? Uh, we kind of touched upon this in the last Hangout, I believe, on Tuesday. Um, but I guess this is kind of a slightly different perspective. So you have the site with all of this duplicate content across the subdomains, and other sites are linking to that duplicate content. And the question is if those external sites would be penalized for linking to something like that, that has a lot of duplicate content. And that's usually not the case. Uh, so if we see external sites or any site linking to another piece of content and we recognize that the other piece of content isn't that great, then that's not something where we would penalize uh, that, that site. It's not that the web ma manual web spam team would come along and say, well, this site is linking to something spammy, therefore it must be spammy too. Uh, in a lot of cases, you don't really know how spammy the other site is because you can't really invest the, the time needed to do like a full web spam analysis of some external site that you happen to be linking to. So 
that shouldn't be the case, that any site is penalized for linking to something that's kind of spammy or duplicate content-ish. Uh, what should we do if we gradually lost 60% Google traffic and visibility in one month due to a core algorithm update, uh, reduce index count, improve user experience, add new quality content, wait for a new core algorithm update, uh, et cetera? So one thing I wouldn't recommend doing is just uh, leaving your hands off and waiting for something to change, because uh, while things always change on the web, just not doing anything is not really a great strategy for making sure that uh, a future change will go positively or in your direction. So this is something where I'd really recommend kind of taking a step back and thinking about what you need to do to significantly improve the quality of your website overall. And sometimes that means reducing the number of index pages, maybe removing cruft that you've collected over the years. Uh, sometimes that means focusing on the design, on the user experience. Uh, sometimes that means focusing more on the content. Um, all of these things essentially add up to one website. And we look at a lot of different factors to try to figure out how should we kind of show this website in search overall. So this is something where I wouldn't focus on like purely technical issues and try to fix it that way, but rather try to take a step back and get feedback from peers, get honest feedback from, from people uh, that will tell you that, oh, this, this looks terrible, and this is a completely broken. So that's the kind of feedback that you want to receive so that you have a better understanding of where the, the bigger issues are with your website or where you could work to significantly take things up to a next level. Um, I work for a dynamic website. Content exists today and will expire later. These pages uh, were told as 404 errors in Search Console later after a month. Um, we'll add content to those pages. Those pages can't be redirected. How to handle that situation? So essentially, these are URLs that exist now. They disappear for a period of time, and then they come back again. Um, in practice, I think this is a kind of a tricky situation because it makes it really hard for our algorithms to figure out how we should treat these pages. We don't have kind of this consistent history available for us to say, well, this is a page that has grown to be really important within your website, because sometimes it's really important, and sometimes it's like it's gone. It's, uh, it's deleted. So that's something where if you can find a different way to handle this type of situation, probably you'd be better off. Uh, if you can't find a different way to handle this situation, then this is uh, something where you could just leave it uh, the way it is. So show content today, turn it into 404 uh, when it's gone, um, turn it back on when you have more content again. I'd use something like a sitemap file to let us know when these changes happen so that we can actually take a look and see, see what's happening there. Um, but essentially, I think probably in, in the bigger picture, it's worth looking at maybe there are other ways that you can handle the situation that don't require this kind of on-off, uh, be it through 404 or no index or uh, unavailable after. These are all kind of methods which you can use to kind of handle this situation when things disappear. But uh, I think that the kind of fluctuating between on and off is probably not that optimal. Um, I've migrated a site to another domain as my client infringed on a competitor's name. Uh, unable to 301 redirect as part of the settlement was to hand over the domain with the same content that's shown is now on page 10. Has Google applied a penalty? So I, I hope you're not using exactly the same content because then the competitor will probably come back and uh, contact you again for that. Uh, but in general, if you don't do a site move, that one that we can recognize through something like a 301 redirect, and uh, with that, you could use a site move tool and Search Console. We essentially treat this as a new website to start off with. So uh, everything that you've kind of built up on so far is essentially associated with the old domain name and not associated with your new website. 
So that's something where you kind of have to start over again uh, with regards to search. And ranking lower would probably be an, a part of the effect there. Also, if you change the content as part of this uh, settlement or issue that you have here, then obviously you'd be ranking differently anyway. So this is something where I, I guess you kind of have to take, take it as it comes there and uh, work on your website to improve it again and think about what you need to do to kind of get things jump-started a little bit. But I guess the good, good part is you have a bit of practice with making websites and you know which things not to do in the future. So that's at least one, one thing that's uh, going for you, I guess. Uh, if a website received 1,000 visits last month and only two this month from organic and the rest of the channels are still bringing their normal traffic, is that a possible penalty? Uh, Search Console says it isn't. So if there's a manual action, then definitely we'd be showing that in Search Console. So that's, at least from that point of view, it, we would not see that as a penalty or as a manual action if you don't see anything in Search Console in a case like this. However, things can change on the web. And uh, that includes our algorithms. That includes the rest of the web. Uh, that in includes a lot of, lot of different things. So um, going from 1,000 visitors a month to two visitors in a month, that's certainly possible. It's not, uh, it's not something I, I would completely rule out. And fluctuations can also happen. So even when things go well, sometimes search will fluctuate a little bit. Uh, with 1,000 visits a month, that's, I don't know, what is that, maybe 30 visits a day? That's not that much traffic. So that's something where uh, sometimes even small fluctuations can have a big impact there. So that's something where maybe this is just a normal change within search. Uh, content delivered from a subdomain, the website uh, watercolorpainting.com is running on WordPress. Uh, the website is loading from a subdomain where WordPress is actually installed. Is that a problem? Uh, no. In general, that's absolutely not a problem because we probably don't even see that when we crawl the website. Uh, we see your main domain. We don't actually see where physically that content is coming from. We just see that this content is being served through your preferred URLs, and that's what we'll focus on. Uh, the one thing to kind of watch out for there is sometimes we might find a link to your staging site or the original source server where this content is currently hosted. And if you don't take any measures to prevent crawling or indexing of that content there, then maybe we'll index that version as well. And in, in an extreme case, maybe we'll say, oh, this is probably the original version, and start showing that in search instead of your preferred version. So that's something to kind of watch out for. On the one hand, maybe you can block crawling and indexing of that, that staging site or that original kind of like content source. Um, alternately, what you could also do is, uh, or not alternately, or maybe additionally, uh, you could uh, make sure that you're using rel canonical on these pages um, so that we really know that this is actually the URL that you do want to have indexed. Uh, JavaScript pop-up on the home page for an email subscription. When you fetch as Google, the Google bot doesn't see the JavaScript pop-up. Visitors see the pop-up on their first visit and have to click. It takes the whole screen. Is this a problem? Um, how can I say this? I, I really find these type of sites terribly annoying. And uh, I see complaints from users all the time about these kind of pop-ups that essentially come up when you're trying to visit a page. And especially when you're on mobile phone, you need to click that small X somewhere in the corner or you have to find that first. That's really annoying. So that's something, at least from me as a user, I would recommend kind of finding a different approach to, to getting people to sign up, because this is, is really frustrating, really annoying. Uh, with regards to, to Google search in, 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 uh, in general, and with the rendering option and you don't see that, then probably Googlebot doesn't see that. Uh, 
I guess the, the tricky part here is if you're using some kind of a technique to block Googlebot from seeing this specifically, then that might be seen as cloaking to some extent. If like users see one version of the page and Googlebot sees something completely different, that wouldn't really be that great. And that might be something where the web spam team might even say, well, this is so shady, we, we need to take action on this. I, I don't think the web spam team would, would take action on normal kind of like email interstitials or like the, the usual pop-ups, download our app or do this or do that. Uh, so it's probably really just for really extreme situations where they might do that. But uh, from a user point of view, I'd really, really recommend getting rid of those stupid pop-ups. They're so frustrating. John, just can I um, ask a question on that, which is sure. there's been talk in the past, I think, back to Matt Cutts' days, when there was talk about doing some serious penalties when people do that kind of stuff. Because those interstitials are really, really annoying. And there are some sites, some very well-known sites, that rank very highly that, you know, you click on them and you get, you're forced to put, you get a JavaScript interstitial for five seconds that's got an ad on it before you can actually get to the content that you want, and it's very frustrating. Are there any intentions to seriously penalize these sites? Because it does seem that they perhaps deserve it more than other sites that get penalized for less important things. I I don't want to to make any predictions about what what the the search quality team might do there, and I I don't know comparing the like interstitials with like pure spam scraped uh, rewritten content I I think that's kind of extreme but uh, it's it's something where where at least from from my point of view it. it of annoy people. And uh, when you look around on Twitter, you, you constantly see people complaining about those types of issues. So I think if you're focusing on the user and you want to make sure that people stay on your website, that they come to your website, they, they recommend it, then probably this is kind of counterproductive to kind of like say, well, first go away and then come maybe come back and look at our content if you actually really want to see it. Because you, you lose a lot of, uh, a lot of people. It, in a case like that. At least that, that's my expectation. I, I don't have any metrics on that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm talking as a user as well, which is that generally when sites do things that really impact users, or certainly that, that show users something completely different to what they're showing Google, that's perhaps more extreme than things that sites might do that users actually don't see at all. So it's just kind of, it, it does seem that something that Google is perhaps, I mean, it's, people probably very rarely say this, but it does seem to be something that Google is under penalizing at the moment, okay. and users would find it much better if that kind of behavior was discouraged, because people will carry on doing it until, you know, people like Google would do something about it, really. Okay, that's good feedback, yeah. Um, may, maybe we should get some broader feedback from, from people in general around this. But it's, uh, I, I totally agree, it's frustrating. <laughs> uh, John, what about, uh, you know, pop-ups like, uh, I don't know, subscribe to our newsletter and get a 10% discount on your first uh, order or something like that. Is it a uh, good practice to kind of delay those a bit into the session rather than just, you know, pop them off as soon yeah. as the user enters? I, I think just from a usability point of view, if you put this in front of a user before they're even able to see what you offer, it's probably counterproductive and that you're not really getting the most value out of that. On the other hand, if you can tell that someone is already browsing your website and they're looking at stuff or maybe they're reading through a longer page, then maybe it makes sense to kind of let them know, hey, if you really like this, this is a great way to kind of keep in touch, uh, stay, stay up to date with uh, the new changes, and um, maybe that makes sense to kind of, like you said, delay it into the session. Okay, but uh, uh, let's say that doesn't happen. Is there the risk that Google, the Googlebot might uh, give higher priority to the content on the pop-up instead of the content behind it? That can happen, yeah. That, that can definitely happen. Okay. Um, and this is a continued question from somewhere. So I'm not sure. Uh, several of the surgeons will repeat across programs, travel itineraries. Uh, probably have to find the original question first, so let me just mark this one. Um, which is a preferred sitemap? 
uh, for Google user sitemap on our web page or XML sitemap in Search Console. Uh, these are very different types of things. So they have very different goals. On the one hand, having an HTML kind of sitemap page within your website can make sense for usability reasons. Uh, on the other hand, the XML sitemap or an RSS feed, an Atom feed, they help us to kind of help search engine which pages are new and have been updated faster. So they're, they're kind of, they have a, a similar name, which makes it really confusing, but uh, they have very different purposes. Um, how long does it take for a website to recover from having JavaScript and images blocked from Googlebot? I had a site that had this block removed, and the rankings have not changed after two months. Um, so I guess what would most likely happen in a case like this is that we'd start indexing the images and start showing those in image search. And in general, for Im images, it's something that takes quite a bit longer than a normal web page. So that's not something where you'd see an immediate jump in traffic from image search, because it just takes longer for us to kind of process those images and bring them up in image search. So that's something from the image search side that, that might be happening there. With regards to web search, in general, this wouldn't have a big impact on the way we handle web search unless the JavaScript was actively pulling in content that we couldn't find without the JavaScript. So if the JavaScript was really creating the content, then you'd probably see a change fairly quickly as soon as we can pick up that content from rendering those pages. On the other hand, if it's just JavaScript on the page and we weren't able to render the page completely, but we found all of the normal content, then you probably wouldn't see a change in web search, or at least no significant change. Uh, a new website, three months old, has much lower rankings in Google than in other search engines. Should I start worrying at this point about penalties from the previous owner? Um, how would the rankings improve? Um, so first off, it's impossible to compare other search engines to, to Google. Everyone has their own algorithms, has their own ways of looking at websites. Uh, just because it's ranking in one engine doesn't mean it'll rank in another engine. The, these are almost, by design, different, because there are different people working on it and different ideas behind them. Sometimes they deliver very similar results, and other times they're very different results. So I wouldn't compare it like that. Uh, with regards to new websites in general, it does take some time for us to understand what the context of this page is, what the relevance of this page is with regards to other content on the web especially if there's a lot of competition in, in a specific area, then that's something where it will be hard for you to kind of take something completely new and start ranking very highly in there. Other people have, might have been working on this for, for years or maybe a decade and longer, and uh, they kind of know what works, and they have a lot of practice. They have built up a good reputation maybe with, with their users, and that's something that you can't really kind of jump over uh, with a new website. You sometimes really have to kind of start at the bottom and start building up uh, your website and making sure that it starts being recognized as the authority in that area. So that's something where I expect it'll just happen more gradually rather than from one day to the next. Uh, with regards to penalties from previous owners, you would see that in Search Console if that was the case, that there was a manual action in place for this website. Uh, for pagination, would you use rel next and previous, including self-canonical, on every page within the series if you don't have a view all page for all articles? Uh, yes, you can do that like that. So essentially what would happen there is we would recognize that this is a series, but we try to index each of those pages separately. Uh, recently, I've changed my sitemap name from whatever slash sitemap XML to something else, sitemap XML, and submitted in Search Console. Will Google reduce the indexing or crawling of my website or web pages? No. Uh, changing the URL of your sitemap file is totally irrelevant for us in the sense that we find the new sitemap file, we start processing the new sitemap file, and we just use those URLs there. It's not something 
where you have to have a history of a sitemap URL for, for things to work. So that shouldn't have any effect at all on crawling, indexing, or ranking. Uh, as far as I know, RankBrain's actual effect on ranking tends to be stronger for long-tail unknown queries. Is it because they're difficult to evaluate due to interpretation difficulty and lack of signals? So RankBrain's role to align scoring method takes a greater part. Yes, that's kind of what, what we're trying to do with, with RankBrain uh, when we really have no idea what to do with a query to kind of understand uh, what it, what the user is trying to say there, and to be able to bring the the more relevant results for for difficult queries like that. Um, watercolorpainting.com. The first menu item, watercolor university visios, is giving power to a subdomain with a parameter. Uh, lessons watercolor is the parameter problem. I guess we should keep the power on the main domain and remove the subdomain. Um, so in general, subdomains are not a problem. Uh, if you want to use subdomains within your website, that's something you can definitely do. Sometimes there are technical reasons to use subdomains or to say, I prefer to use uh, one domain and use subdirectories. Uh, but that's more up to you. I, from my point of view, I, I think focusing on one domain makes it easier to diagnose issues. But that's essentially up to you. Uh, with regards to a parameter in the URL, that's also totally up to you. If you want to use parameters in URLs, uh, we can definitely work around that or work with that, uh, better said. Uh, the important part might be to double check the parameter handling tool in Search Console that you're not accidentally blocking these parameters on your side. But uh, from our point of view, parameters are fine as URLs. Uh, in an SEO audit, we discovered two sets of URLs hinting to duplicate content. The only way the two sets distinguish each other is that one ends with a slash and the other one doesn't. What should we do? Um, for the most part, you don't need to do anything because we can figure this out. Having two URLs instead of one URL is not something that would cause significant duplicate content issues. Um, but if you're an SEO and you like to have things under control, you probably have one version that you prefer. And if that's the case, then you can use the usual canonicalization tools to, to kind of help us pick that one as the one that we show in the search results. So that's redirecting, like you mentioned. Uh, rel canonical is, is a great approach here, because sometimes it's, it's tricky to redirect uh, things like that. So those are probably the, the two things I'd focus on. Obviously, making sure that you're consistently using the right URL within your website for linking and within your sitemap file are also good things to do. What's the future of Google Shopping? Could shopping style ads replace text ads in the future? I don't know. Um, I don't know what, what the plans with Google Shopping are, so I can't really make any predictions. I mean, I guess in this case, it's a yes or no question, so I could just say maybe. But I, I really don't have any insight. Um, one of my clients asks me to don't get indexed the, the website inner page URLs on, in the google.co.in search results, and that all URLs should get indexed on google.com. You can't control this. So um, essentially, the the, the Google version that we use to serve the content is uh, based mostly on, on the location of the user. And we'll use that for kind of geo-targeting. But you can't limit the, the serving of your URLs within web search to specific countries. So you can't say, I want my content only shown to users within the US or only shown to people worldwide except for Switzerland, because they're all jerks. Um, that's not something you can do in web search. Uh, so either it's indexed or it's not indexed. Uh, that's kind of the level that you can do. Or you can use geotargeting, hreflang, to say, I prefer to have this URL shown for users in that country. But you can't say, I don't want it shown at all. 
Uh, will this be considered duplicate content? Will it somehow affect my rankings? Uh, as it doesn't appear to be unique content, I was recommended to non-index several of these and just leave index the main pages, which lead to all programs. Oh, this is probably another one of those multiple part questions. So, uh, if so, I'm just going to estimate wh what the question might be. Um, are you here in the Hangout? Oh. This is the first half of that other one, isn't it? Because I was talking about travel itineraries. OK, I found another part. Uh, my site has several programs, travel itineraries, which vary according to number of days of stay, like four, five, or six, or eight days. Uh, given that these all refer to the same destination, they simply vary in the tour type. Um, I guess this goes on to, to the duplicate content part. Um, is this a problem? Should I no-index these pages? What should I do? Um, in general, this is not something where you'll find an absolute answer, because sometimes it makes sense to keep alternate variations of, of a piece of content indexed separately. Sometimes it makes sense to fold them into, together into one page. Um, so in, in this kind of a situation, if you think that these different number of days are essentially more like attributes rather than actually independent products that stand on their own, then maybe it makes sense to have one page that shows the main content and that lists like the variations for the in individual number of days. The advantage of having one page is that this page will probably be a bit stronger in search. So if someone's searching for um, a tour of, in this case, the Galapagos, then probably you will be able to say, well, this is a really strong page on this topic. Whereas if you split it up into each separate pages for each number of different days, then we'll probably say, well, these are all kind of good pages, but maybe not that awesome. So sometimes it makes sense to compile everything together into one stronger page. Sometimes it makes sense to say, well, these are sufficiently unique pages that I really want to have them indexed separately. Can I just say something? If they, sure. um, if those are, if this is a, isn't just an analogy and it is actually at a, an exact example, then if there's no difference between an adventure tour and a standard tour and you can't create content around those two, then they shouldn't really be having those on the site. And if there's a four day versus an eight day, there's a world of difference between those. They should be. Yeah, I mean, Se sometimes things. They're, they're very They're different. not close analogies. They're totally uh, different products. So they should definitely be separate pages. Although your answer was just as good. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, you probably run into this problem all the time, too, right? Yeah, and, and if it's, you know, they're talking about two totally, there's a lot of difference between a four and an eight day vacation. Otherwise, don't offer them. And if you do offer them, write two of them. <laughs> sure. Back to John. Thanks. OK. Um, some guy just dropped a link in the comments. I guess that's an, a variation as well. Um, is there a limit on the number of characters that will be featured for a snippet in a paragraph form rather than list form? Not that I'm aware of. We try to kind of compile that like any other type of snippet uh, based on what we think makes sense. Um, how to implement AMP on a single page WordPress website. Uh, just want to promote the business offers on my website. Adding to the question, is there any way for regional AMPs as I do have regional websites for my business? Uh, you can make AMP pages for any page, or you can convert your whole website to, to an AMP page. That's possible as well. The ampproject.org AMP website, for example, is completely written in AMP, and it works everywhere as well. So that might be an option. Um, the other aspect here is if this is just a business informational page, then probably we wouldn't be showing the AMP version in the search results, at least not at the moment. So I don't know how much return you will get on making these AMP pages uh, at the moment. Um, but if you want to convert everything to AMP because you think AMP is really fast and fantastic, then that's obviously one option. Uh, do you have any feedback about whether or not Structured Data team plans to develop support for schema.org slash service? Um, I don't know. That's 
uh, really hard to, to say what, what the future plans are around some of these things. I know, especially with rich cards, there, there are various things where the team is working on, on trying to expand that. So it's possible that we'll pick up more, more types of markup like that. But I don't know what the specific plans are, are there. But since you asked about the Hangout, maybe we can have them answer this question directly uh, when, when I get them to, to join. All right. Wow, we made it through. And just slightly over time. Uh, is there anything else on your mind that we need to get through? Uh, I have a question about AMP. Um, somebody else asked at the beginning, is it something that is now going to be carrying on as standard and it's always something you're going to be supporting? And I mean, is it is it something that, given that it's open open source, even if you decided it wasn't something you were going to do anymore, then can it even disappear since it's just open source HTML? Can it, wor it worries me because it, when you see something like this, let, let's take Google authorship as an example, and everyone decides we need authorship. We've got to make sure we connect our site to it, we've got to churn out articles, we've got to update Google+, then suddenly you say, we don't really like that anymore. That's fine because it's just a few tags on a page and it's just, you know, you don't publish every so often. It's probably not had much of an effect, but if you build your whole site out of something and you say, yeah, don't like that anymore, then that's that's a problem. Yeah, I, I can't make any promises for, for always. Um, so I, from, from that point of view, it's, it's hard to say. Um, when, when talking with the AMP team, the, the, the folks that, that are working on the, the AMP project HTML stuff, they see this essentially as a JavaScript framework like, like anything else, where you could say, well, this is what you could build your website on. And uh, they see it as something that could be used in, in, instead of a normal website in general. So it's not something that I'd say will go away when Google star stops kind of switching things out, but uh, rather something that, like any other HTML page, could su be supported for the long run. But I, I totally take your point on, like, how do I know that uh, Google won't say this is irrelevant next week, um, which I, I really can't answer in an absolute way. I know the team is really dedicated on this, and. I don't see this going away anytime soon because they have so many plans and they're, they're working so hard on, on moving things forward there. Um, if anything, I expect this to, to kind of become more and more relevant um, over, the, over the, the future. But I don't know how things will look in, let's say, five years down the road. That's mm. a really long time on the internet. So the AMP team aren't in temporary offices or anything with no, only a few months left no, no, on the lease. No, no. No. They're, they're, really, they're really into it. It's, uh, I, I think it's, it's a really in interesting initiative anyway because it's kind of like thinking about like how would you make web pages if you had to start over again. And uh, the, the speed differences are, are crazy. So uh, the, the right. eBay example mentioned in the beginning, that's something where you, I, I loaded up the, the original page and the AMP page, and I was clicking around on the AMP page, and then I clicked back to the original page, and I noticed it was still loading. Like, I was already doing stuff on the other page, while this one is still still kind of, like, uh, taking its time to actually load. So that's something where even if the, the main effect of AMP <laughs> is that uh, normal web pages kind of increase their speed by factor 10, I, I think that would be a big win for the web. All right, uh, let's take a break here. Um, it's been great having you all here. Uh, thanks for all the questions and comments along the way and the submitted questions as well. And um, I just noticed I need to set up the next Hangout, so I'll be setting those up. If there's anything else on your mind until then, feel free to jump by the, the Webmaster Help Forums or to drop it into one of the future Hangouts. Um, wish you all a great weekend, and hopefully I'll see you again in one of the next ones. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thank you.